Hey there. Welcome to the More Miles podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Michelle. Hey, and I'm Scott. All right. We are here in episode two, and we are talking about heart rate training today. So to key up this episode a little bit, um, heart rate training, I think we could probably sit here and talk about for hours. Um, there's a lot to dig into. Um, there's a lot of different ways to use it, ways to apply it, and it applies differently to different athletes in, that are training for different events in different phases, different cycles. Um, so there's a lot that we have to cover, and I am certain we're not going to cover everything that we could. Um, so. Welcome to the heart rate training episode. Um, if you have questions as you are listening or at the end of the episode, please feel free to leave a comment either on the episode itself um, or reach out to us uh, through our website, moremilestogo.com or any of our social channels at More Miles Run Coaching, because um, we can certainly talk more about all of this. So, but okay. To get us started, heart rate training. Um, I think when most people think of heart rate training, they are probably thinking first of low heart rate training. That has become sort of a, a common and a hot topic recently um, over the past five, six, maybe more years. Um, so let's start there. What is low heart rate training and uh, what are the benefits of it? What's why are we even why do we even care about low heart rate training? Um, Michelle, why don't we start with you? What what is low heart rate training? Yeah, so low heart rate training, um, when based on the five zone heart rate model that most watches have, or you see quite commonly, is typically done in zone two, which is 60 to 70% of your max heart rate. So it's in this very easy zone. It should feel extremely easy, very conversational. Um, you know, your breath might pick up a little bit, but nothing super exertion. You know, you're not going max effort. You're not even going moderate effort. It's a very easy area that you spend your time running in. Um, and you can always test that by trying to speak, speak a full sentence, not like a couple words. And if you're able to carry on a conversation, you're probably in zone two. So if you're on um, an RPE, a rate of perceived exertion model, it's probably like in that three to four range um, about during a run or a jog. Um, and we typically see zone two during your recovery runs, your easy runs, your depending on the easy run, um, and then your long runs, you know, non-workout long runs. Um, and you know, it does, it, what it does is it improves your aerobic capacity. It gives your body, um, scientifically you're building mitochondria in your body, which is going to give you more energy over time. Um, it's going to build your fitness, but it also allows you to add mileage into your week without adding a ton of stress on your body where like the harder workouts will be a much harder stressor. You're able to run more miles at an easier pace, um, and just generally build up your endurance and your fitness overall. Scott, do you have anything to add about low heart rate training, why we use it? Yeah, I, I would add that um, I'm really uh, big on the MAF method, um, which it's an acronym. There's actually something it stands for. So it's maximum aerobic function. Um, and to Michelle's point, you know, there's a reason for that, right? We, we specifically are placing MAF runs or heart rate training runs into an athlete's schedule. Um, but specifically with, with MAF, um, if somebody, if an athlete is not used to focusing on heart rate training, right, it could be a little bit difficult to keep your heart rate at a certain level. So with MAF, um, the goal is to get to a specific uh, heart rate number. And so there's an equation for that. It's 180 minus your age. So you take that, that equation, you come up with a number. And that's what uh, you should be running. Your heart rate should be at that number or below, at or below that number, uh, for your run. And so if you're an athlete that's never really focused um, on heart rate training, it may be a little bit difficult to keep that heart rate that low. The intent, though, is to be able to run, you know, a, a, a defined run um, at or below that heart rate and continue to run. So it's not uncommon sometimes uh, that an athlete may have to walk or slow down a little bit to get that heart rate down. But in the long run, you know, it really should be something that you should be running that entire run right at or below that that heart rate so i'm really big on that from an ultra marathon standpoint um for me just personally i think it's 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 something looking at a defined heart rate number is a, is a little bit easier for me as opposed to trying to stay in a zone um and so that's just another avenue another way to kind of keep yourself uh, in check basically um but i wanted to ask uh, uh you both i mean again math being very specific 
when do you use math and when do you incorporate that into your athletes training? Well, I think, um, so part of the reason I, I introduced this episode and say there's a lot to unpack here is because the way that we use low heart rate training and the reason we use low heart rate training is really variable to the individual. Um, there's, there's so many benefits to it. Um, you guys touched on a lot of them, but, um, training. So, so Scott, you mentioned, um, you like to use the, the math method, maximum aerobic function. So there is a formula that we use to calculate your baseline, uh, maximum aerobic function, but that is literally a math formula that is just 180 minus your age. It doesn't take into account the individual. Um, it doesn't take into account their experience, their fitness level, the way that they're training. Um, so even using your math heart rate as your, uh, using that to calculate your aerobic zone, um, there's a lot of variability there. There's the, the more consistent that you are, the more experienced that you are, um, your math heart rate can actually flex a lot, or not a lot, a good bit higher, five to 10 beats higher than that 180 minus your age number. Um, to the other side, if you are an athlete, you know, we start again with that 180 minus your age number as a baseline. Um, if you are an athlete who is frequently injured or frequently sick or is you know, struggling and not responding well to your training, we might go the other direction and tailor it in a different way. So we're taking your baseline number and we might take away five to 10 beats to really bring down the intensity at that, um, at that heart rate zone or at that recovery level. Um, there's a lot going on there when you're training at a low heart rate. Your maximum aerobic function is also the system I like to use. Um, with that definition, what we're really working on is your aerobic zone and developing your aerobic zone. Michelle mentioned um, you're growing, developing more mitochondria. You're innervating more capillaries into your muscle fibers. So you are getting better oxygen delivery, better nutrient delivery into your musculoskeletal system. Um, this happens over time. You have to be consistent in doing this aerobic zone training, uh, but that's how you do it. You don't get those benefits when you're at a higher uh, effort level. So we're also working on your form um, and your efficiency. That's a huge component of low heart rate training. Um, a lot of people, when the, Scott, you mentioned when they first try it, um, it takes some time to be able to run continuously at a low heart rate. Um, and really what we need to work on there is running form and running efficiency. Um, so your low heart rate is a chance to increase your cadence, um, which is going to improve your efficiency um, and really practice a softer, gentler, lower impact form that is going to then benefit you when you go out to run harder and faster also. Um, so there's a lot happening there. There's a lot of metabolic changes when you're working at, in an aerobic zone exclusively. Um, the, the energy systems that you're using are different than when you're working at a higher intensity. Um, so there's a lot happening there. Um, I mentioned a little bit the using maximum aerobic function as the system that I like to use um, for low heart rate training and for recovery zone training. Uh, but that's not the only way that we calculate low heart rate training. So I want to throw back for a second. Uh, Michelle, you mentioned zone two um, in the beginning. How, how is that different than MAF or uh, MAF calculation? The math resides in zone two. It's definitely zone two, but I think there's there's different calculators you can use. Um, and personally, I calculate using heart rate reserve to figure out zone two for my athletes if I know the stats or I have them do it. Um, it gives a little bit broader range for those easier runs. So I keep, for my athletes, I keep recovery runs math, purely math runs, just like we talked about to make sure they're really, really down in that low zone. But for easier runs, I mean, they can go into zone three a little bit even, and I know we'll talk about that coming up as well. But for zone two, like just the general easy long runs um, and easy runs, zone two on heart rate reserve might give you a little bit broader range. So you're taking out, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm getting too high or I feel really slow. You can still can get more of a consistent pace in that zone. So it's 60 to 70% um, of your max heart rate. So max heart rate for different people can vary a lot. So I know the big estimate is 220 minus your age to get your max heart rate, but most people know that's not even remotely accurate. So I like that because it's more personalized. 
heart rate reserve will take in your actual max heart rate, which you can typically look at a race to see about what your max heart rate is, and then your resting heart rate. So it accounts for your total fitness. Um, so the broader that range, the bigger your zone two will be. Um, but really it's that 60 to 70% of your max heart rate range is zone two. Um, and there's just slightly different calculations for it, but they're all in the same ballpark within, I would say two to three beats of each other. So any calculator you pick is gonna get you a good estimate. Um, and even that being said, even if you use a really specific calculator, it's just an estimate because your specific zone two to your physiology, the only way to test that is in a lab. And most of us don't have the ah, resources to go get that done. So we're all estimating here. This is our 60 to 70% range or your math range is a good estimate to keep you within that. Um, and, you know, and these heart rate zones are a continuum. Like your watch will segment them and say, okay, you're in the blue zone easy today. And this is green zone, zone two, and your yellow zone threshold. They don't work like that in real life In actual physiology you're kind of in a gradient so you're going from recovery into zone two is kind of like you're just going to be burning a little more carbs than fat you know your lactate may be building up a little bit more and that's really it there's no hard and fast in your body so using these are guidelines versus you know don't stress if you got two beats over or under the zone it's not doing anything drastic to your training Michelle, I, I wanted to add, I, I like that you said that math resides within zone two. Um, I love using the math method. I just I just do. Again, for me, it's just that that tangible number I can look at. But the one thing I do want to you know, stress, and you said it too, is it's just a gauge, right? That number is a barometer, right? And so even to the point of, I think my watch sometimes is not on properly. So when I see that heart rate number, you know, I don't freak out. I don't, you know, worry. Am I am I right on it? So um, it's variable, and I think like you know, athletes are different. But I think it's good to stress that it's a gauge. It's a number to gauge and kind of guide you where you want to go. Um, but it can vary. Yeah, and even that being said, like your watch might be malfunctioning. So it's really important when you're starting in heart rate training to learn how that feels in your body, because then you can say, okay, like I know my watch is wrong. I've had my watch on a math run jump to 175 when I forgot my chest strap. I know darn well, I'm nowhere near 175. Um, my watch is just kind of glitching out or picking up my cadence or whatever that is. Um, but I think it's also good, like if you forget your watch and you're on vacation, you can figure it out in your own body. You know what that feels like with that RPE. Uh, and there's also runners who can't run by heart rate. They, there's literally people who can't run in heart rate zones. And for them, that's when we use the RPE scale instead because you can align the effort level and they'll still get the same adaptations in their body as if they were heart rate training just by feel so just start to learn i guess when you're starting out it's really important to learn what that zone two actually feels like in your own world so i want to elaborate on that a little bit in comparing stepping back for a second and comparing the math and the zone two method um, and making sure to highlight when we are talking about zones um, we are talking about a five zone model, which is what you're going to see on your watch. So if you have a Garmin or a Koros, they use a five zone model. Um, zone two, you know, we were mentioning if you are calculating by math using that 180 minus your age, that that is an imperfect calculation. It's just a formula to get us started. It's not a firm number. Um, what you're often going to see on your watch for zone two is those fluctuations your gar your watch gets to know you so you wear it every day for every workout it has calculated your heart rate at different paces in different weather conditions if you wear your your watch all day even better because it's measuring your low heart rate zone your resting heart rate also um so typically what you're going to see is garmin trying to estimate those fluctuations for you um so your your strict 180 minus your age um, is going to be within that zone two, but the fitter, the more consistent you are is where you're going to see zone two start to expand above your calculated math heart rate because they're doing that data interpretation for you. Um, and again, still, as you guys mentioned, is imperfect. Um, it's, it's still an estimate, but it's giving you a little bit more based on your actual data and actual feedback from, from wearing it regularly. Um, as you guys started to mention in terms of measuring your low heart rate, um, that it is important to make sure that we're not uh, living and dying by one specific number, um, but there's a lot that can affect your heart rate. So the, the way that you're measuring it is one way, um, but there's a lot of factors that go into 
where your heart rate may be residing on any given day. Um, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, why don't we start first with how to measure your heart rate? Um, what are the different ways that we are tracking this and, and what is the best way to track it um, in a workout specifically on the, on the run? So, um, you know, there's a few different ways. You can go old school by counting your, stopping your run or on your run, counting your pulse, um, you know, 10 seconds multiply by six. So you count the number of heartbeats within 10 seconds, multiply that by six, and then that's your beats per minute um, or by 15 times four. There's a few different mathematical ways to do that. And that's a very old school method. Um, you also have your watch, which has an optical sensor on it that measures the expansion and contraction of your veins in your wrist. Um, and that'll give you, again, a good estimate on your watch of your heart rate. And then there's chest straps. Um, and that's the most accurate. They use actual electrodes that are attached under your chest and they can measure the electrical current of your heart. So that gives the most, the most accurate of any consumer product is going to be using the chest strap. And they almost always tie into your watch or your phone or whatever device you use to track your mileage and pace. Um, but I personally will use a chest strap for any intense workout to get a good accurate measure in. Yeah. So think, are all, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Scott. No, just, those are all fantastic. Um, myself, I'm, I'm very minimal. Um, I, I've never worn a chest strap, knowing that's the most ideal and optimal to get that right number. Uh, but I am very big on, you know, checking it right, right here on my neck, um, if ever in doubt. Because to your point, Michelle, there's been plenty of times in a run where I or or an athlete that I'm coaching is saying, there's no way that my heart rate is 175, 180, right? The old test right here is, is a perfect way. Um, and, I, and I like that because again, it's, it's it, especially for ultra marathon training, you know, we have the ability to kind of slow down a little bit and really kind of do that, right? If you're, if you're running a 5K, it may be a little bit more difficult to, to check your pulse, right? And then do the calculation in your head. Um, so everybody's different, but, but for, for me and a lot of the athletes I, I coach in the ultra world, you know, it's, it's, it's checking your pulse, but, uh, yeah, there's many different ways to, to do it. So I think that's important to touch on, um, the, the most accurate way of measuring your heart rate is with an electrode sensor. Um, the chest straps are the most common. Um, there's also a few like arm straps, Skosh makes one and, uh, Koros recently came out with an arm strap. Um, those are just as good. It, the, the, Different. The thing is that there's an electrode on your skin that is actually measuring your pulse. Um, the chest straps also come with all sorts of cool data. Aside from being really accurate to your heart rate, um, they can measure your stride length, your left, right uh, ground contact time and differential. Like there's a, a lot of data that you don't even necessarily need, but they track a lot of cool stuff. Um, that being said, the, the wrist-based optical sensor is probably the easiest. There's no smart watch that doesn't have a heart rate sensor in 2023. Um, so these are easy. You're wearing your watch anyway. It's right there. You don't need to get an extra device to sync and add to it. Um, but, you know, Scott, like you mentioned, they're not perfect. Um, so a couple ways that it's important to make sure you're wearing your watch so that you're getting the most accurate from your sensor. Um, I'm going to show for people who are watching on YouTube, but if you're not watching um, and you're listening instead, you want to wear, you can see my heart rate tan. Here's the little bump of my wrist. You want to wear the, the wrist bone there. Your watch should go above that. So you're not wearing it on the bone of your wrist. That's going to hurt anyway um, as it moves around. And you're not wearing it above that where you're on your wrist or even like moving up into your hand. Um, you need to wear it above that bone on your wrist so that your watch sits flat and flush against your wrist and on your skin. Um, the next thing is to make sure that you are really wearing it tight. So if you're someone who wears your watch all day long, you're probably going to need to tighten it an extra notch for your run. And you can loosen it back up when you're done with your run. Um, but when you're running and you're getting a lot of movement in there, if that watch is moving around, if it can slide or rotate on your wrist, it's too loose. And what happens then is it can pick up your cadence or your arm swing and that interferes with its measurement. Um, so if you find that you feel like you're working out at a really, really low effort, easy effort, and your heart rate on your watch is displaying 
something high, 180 maybe, um, it's probably picking up your cadence instead of your actual heart rate. And the best solution for that is to tighten it up, make it make it a tighter fit on your wrist. Specifically, uh, oddly enough, in the winter, this becomes a bigger problem uh, when it's cold outside. So in the summer, you might be able to just go out for your run and get a good measurement. Um, in the winter, when it's colder, you really got to make sure you're tightening an extra notch and keeping that firm against your wrist. It's more common to see that um, cadence interference in the winter. Um, okay, so that's the tech side of it, how we measure your heart rate. But there's a lot. So, you know, we're talking about using a low heart rate zone um, or using a, a definition of guidelines to define your low heart rate zone and where you need to be. Um, your pace at that low heart rate can vary really quite a bit throughout the week and throughout a training cycle. Um, so what kind of things affect the pace that you're able to run at your defined low heart rate? Yeah, it, it, there's multiple elements that can, can affect your pace. And Probably the most common is going to be environmental elements, you know, the weather. I mean, we're in the middle of the summer and you know, we're, we're coming out of it. But, you know, if it's really hot, you know, your, your heart rate's going to be a little bit higher, right? It's going to impact that. You know, your sleep, um, you know, it, it, anything that's going to impact, you know, you know your body, right, um, is going to be an element. So I stress that a, a lot to athletes is, hey, again, going back to this is a gauge. You know, heart rate is just a tool we're using as a, as a gauge. But if you're running a long run in the middle of the summer, you've got to add that into it as well. So your pace you know, may be impacted even more drastically because it's hot, you know, because you're slowing down. And the one thing that I do try to stress is, is, is a lot of athletes really um, may focus on the pace, right? The pace of their run. Um, and don't worry about that pace being slow. You know, you may say, I've had athletes after their first math run say, oh my gosh, you know, my pace was this slow. And I say, yes, it, it, it is because you're, you're adjusting to that. Number one, you're adjusting to a new style of training. Um, but two, what other elements happened that day? Was it hot? Was it cold? You know, how did you sleep last night? What did you eat last night? You know, all those type of things are going to play into it. Um, but as you progress, as you, you train and learn, this this method um, of heart rate training, you know, you'll adjust. Your pace will start getting a little bit quicker. But um, again, lots of factors, and I think the biggest for me that I pe uh, preach is those environmental factors that that creep in. Michelle, I know you can expand upon that and how um, the way that you are handling the environmental factors also has an impact on on your heart rate. What um, hydration and fueling status is probably a big piece here too. Yeah, for sure. I've noticed the biggest fluctuations in my heart rate, even my resting heart rate with hydration, like being even slightly dehydrated, it's going to jack your heart rate up. Um, when you're dehydrated, your blood is thicker. So your heart has to pump harder and faster to get blood to your muscles. So the more hydrated you are, um, the better, you know, the lower your heart rate is going to be, but other factors affect it like caffeine intake. So if you have your coffee in the morning, or you had an extra cup of coffee, or you had an extra caffeinated gel, your heart rate's going to go up. It's a stimulant. It's going to raise your heart rate. And that's the intended effect of that. Um, just know that it's going to raise your heart rate. Um, alcohol will also increase your heart rate. Um, like if you had a few drinks the night before, um, hopefully not right before your run, but like the night before your run, um, it's going to dehydrate you. And it's also a stressor on your body. So your heart rate the next day is going to be higher. But like Scott said, your sleep affects it and alcohol affects your sleep, which is then also going to be that double whammy against your heart rate in the morning. So just not saying you should never do it. Just know that that's going to be the impact on your workout the next day is you're going to have a higher heart rate. You may not be as recovered, which is also going to raise your heart rate um, and thus slow your pace. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to say, like, you know, we're not going to increase our pace to get, um, you know, not increase our heart rate to stay in a pace zone because then you're not getting the adaptations that we're trying to prescribe for you. So you really do need to stay in that low heart rate zone on these easier runs and adjust your pace downward so that you're not stressing it. But yes, um, nutrition does have a huge factor. And honestly, even too much sugar. Um, if you overdo your carbs, even on the run, your heart rate's going to go up. So just keeping in mind, um, you know, sugar does, and then inflammatory foods will also do the same thing. Any type of stressor on your body, regardless of whether it's nutrition, sleep, 
environmental is going to raise your heart rate um, and stress in your life will raise your heart rate overall as well. So any stressor basically is going to translate to a higher heart rate in the same pace zone. So I think that really emphasizes a, a point that we can circle back to is why we use heart rate as, as a training tool. Um, and, you know, again, as we mentioned, it doesn't work for everybody. We all have athletes that um, we prescribe a, a pace rather than a heart rate or, or a perceived exertion rather than a heart rate. So um, be sure that you talk to your coach about this if you're feeling stressed or um, anxious or frustrated uh, with your heart rate training because it, it isn't for everybody and that's okay. However, at least at More Miles Run Coaching, the most common place that we are assigning heart rate training is as a recovery tool. Um, and that's why it's so important is that we are using your heart rate number to let your body tell us what it actually needs to recover on the run. We're taking your brain out of the picture. We're not letting your perceived exertion or your pace or anything play into it. Um, so using it as a recovery tool so that you can actively recover, we're increasing your total running volume, increasing your running economy. But you know, to, to both of your points, you know, if you have had a hard workout session the day before, if it's particularly intense or, or you're particularly exhausted from it, your recovery run the next day that's based on heart rate is going to be slower. And that's your body talking to us saying, I need a gentle today. I'm not going to recover at X pace. I need to be at this heart rate to, to make sure I'm recovering. Um, and that whether or not it's from a workout, it's you know, the points that you both made about all of the other factors that can affect dehydration, sleep, nutrition, um, heat is, is a huge thing, weather that will uh, affect your heart rate. So using your heart rate rather than a, a pre-prescribed pace is really our way to assure that we're listening to your body and giving your body the recovery that it needs. Um, yeah. I, is there anything else that we can add about low heart rate training specifically before we move on to our next topic? I, I would just add in, in, you know, from the ultra marathon world, the name of the game is time on feet. You know, you've got to be getting those miles in. And so it, it's very critical, you know, programming in specific low intensity, low heart rate runs, right? To allow yourself to actively recover, to stay on your feet. If I'm doing a very hard workout on a Wednesday, I'm focused on that. But I know the next day I've got a recovery run to keep me going, right? And so it's very intentional. And sometimes an athlete will look at that recovery run as you know, maybe they call it jump miles. Maybe they just call it, I'm just going to go out there and do whatever. There's, a, there's intent to it, even though it may be a very slow pace, there's intent specifically with that, with that run. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, but to elaborate, so you, you mentioned junk miles and that sort of uh, brings up an interesting point too, is um, we, we started this conversation talking about low heart rate and, and why that is important. And I think we could probably even expand further upon that um, specifically if there are any questions to follow this episode. Um, but moving on from low heart rate, um, or zone two or, um, wherever we, that low heart rate zone is for us. Um, what about the rest of it? Because we've got a, a whole lot of room that comes after that low heart rate. What are we, what are we doing, um, in, in the next level of heart rate above your, your low heart rate recovery zone? Yeah. So zone three, there's like, if you look on. Instagram or TikTok, there's like all this controversy over zone three, which personally I disagree with. Um, there's a lot of people saying never go into zone three. It's the gray zone. It's stay out of this area. Um, and a lot of my athletes are half marathon and marathon athletes. Um, and that's where you spend a lot of your time in these races is zone three. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. Um, I don't know any, you know, like Scott said, zone two is like the ultra world. I don't have anyone running a marathon in zone two. So we're not there. We're higher than that. So we need to spend time in those higher zones um, and even zone four. Um, and towards the end of your races, it's zone five. You are all on at the end of those races. So we need to practice each of those zones, zone three, zone four, zone five, each have their own. And we talk about, you know, the benefits of every run. 
and how these heart rate zones are continuum. So there shouldn't be this gray zone. Like you live a good portion of your marathon in that zone three, and we need to, your body needs to adapt to be in that zone, to be comfortable in that zone, to spend two, three, four hours in that zone um, as well. And then, you know, zone four is another rung up than that. And we need that zone because that's where your body's learning to clear lactate out and really make some more anaerobic adjustments that we do need. Um, and on to zone five. So like each zone has a very specific adaptation in your body that we need. And I think the majority of athletes need to spend time in every single one of the zones. And regardless of what race you're training for, it's just a matter of how much time you're spending in each of those zones based on your goals and your, your background. I love the way that you brought that up. And I think um, maybe it's a hot take, but it, I think there are so many different methods of training that, that are out, the, out in the world. Um, and I think if you have a coach or a system that is prescribing your training by one method only, I think it's lazy. And, and I think maybe even worse is uneducated or, or uninformed. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. There is no one system that is going to work for every athlete. And there's no one system that's going to work for one athlete all of the time. Um, and I think for a lot of the athletes we coach, um, I would say the bulk of our team is between half marathon distances and ultra distances. And none of those are raced in a low heart rate zone, even the ultra stuff. Um, you might spend some time in your low heart rate zone in an ultra, but most of it, probably not. You're probably going to be in that gray zone. Um, and you're certainly going to have moments that you're higher than that, that you are reaching threshold or even your max capacity when you're climbing up a hill or a mountain, when you are sprinting for the finish. Um, you know, we spend time in all of our heart rate zones, not just this one and this one, that it's it's black and white. So we shouldn't be training that way. We shouldn't be training in only this one and this one. We need our metabolic system. We need our uh, energy systems. We need our form and, and the way that we're moving to spend time in all of these zones. Um, and especially the, the longer that you are gonna spend on race day in that sort of gray zone, um, you should spend adequate time training there and getting adapted to it, getting your, your hips and your stride comfortable at that moderate effort. Um, so I, I totally agree. I, I think the, the gray zone, the junk mile zone um, is a myth. I, I think you should spend some time there. Um, and that's a little bit different, again, to the athlete, I think, it, getting back to having one method or one way, uh, the, the great answer of how much time you should spend there or should you spend time there is it depends. It, it depends on the athlete, the goal. Um, I totally agree with you there. Scott, I feel like you're ready to say something and I keep talking. So oh, <laughs> go ahead no. and add what you had to add. No, I, I think just uh, maybe just repetitive here. I think in the ultra marathon world, you know, there, there might be this thought or myth and of just running slow every single day. Right, because if, if you're thinking about running 50 miles, you just want to get to the finish line. So, I've had athletes come to me and ask, "Well, why are we doing speed work? Why are we doing pace work? Why are we doing?" You know, in, in any given week, there's going to be multiple sessions that are specifically tailored, right, a little bit differently. And so, and there's a reason for that. And so, I think that um, it, it all comes back to yes, it's about time on feet in the ultra world. But even if an athlete sees uh, a, a day that it's super slow, there's a reason for that. If they see a day where they're doing intervals on the track, why am I doing intervals on the track? I'm training for a 50 mile race. There's a reason for that, right? It's working your system in a different way. Um, so I think that's, that's, that can't be called out enough in the ultra world um, that yes, it's a long day. It's, it's a lot of miles, but if you train appropriately, right? And you change things up and you work your system in different ways, you can reap the benefits in your ultra a lot. Yeah, I think variety is the key for every athlete. Um, and that's variety within your weekly training, but also variety in the big picture of, of the way that you're training in a season and in a year. Um, so you're right, whether you are training for your very first 5k or you're running six ultra marathons a year, um, 
variety is the key to improvement. You've, you've got to have some of everything in there. And there's a time and a place, you know, there, there are periods of your training cycle where you should be doing easy only, low heart rate only. Um, that's probably not a place that you're going to live and hang out for a full training cycle or a full year or a long term period. Um, but there is a time and a place for that. Um, there's also a time and place that you're going to be doing more intensity and, and higher, higher efforts, higher heart rates. Um, yeah. So I think every athlete, even the ultra athletes, even your very beginning athletes, uh, variety is the key and, and you should not be spending all of your time in one area, um, or even all of your time in a black and a white, uh, zone or, or area. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that before before we move on to um, high heart rates and where that comes into play, I want to ask real quick. Uh, we had opened up a Q and A um, to our run squad to see if there were any particular questions they wanted us to cover on um, on this episode about heart rate training. One of the questions we got is the difference between a math run and easy uh, math is the term that I use to describe you guys a low heart rate run. Um, an easy run and a long run. So let's talk about that real quick. I think it's probably a little bit different for each coach um, and the way that you are defining and prescribing for your athlete or for a particular athlete. Um, so how would you guys define the the difference there? Low heart rate, easy, and uh, how you're using it in a long run? Yeah, I would say that um, for for my programming, it would be you know the heart rate, again, focused on math. Right, we've got a specific heart rate number we're trying to stay at or below for a specific reason. Easy runs are more gonna be looked at pace, right? So typically what is your you know, typical average pace um, you know, per mile? Uh, I look at that specifically for easy runs. And then in the long run, um, there could be variability there, right? It could be um, we're focused on low heart rate, but we could also have some work inside of that long run. So it's not just going out there and running 15 to 20 miles at a low heart rate. It could be maybe the first five miles are done warming yourself up, very low heart rate, maybe the middle miles, um, you're putting a little bit of an effort in there, whether that's a, a pace goal, whether that's a, you know, a couple of miles pretty hard. And then you finish that long run, let's say with back down into your low heart rate again, then you've got a, a long one run where you're working everything right? You're working a lot of different systems. So um, that's how I define it. Um, but I guess going back to the, the, the math um, is a specific number uh, where the others might be pace or that we may just change things up. How about yeah. you, Michelle? I kind of agree with that. So um, my math runs, I strategically place them for my athletes as recovery runs or shakeout runs before a race. So they're kind of strategically placed either before or after hard work. So we're not stressing the body anymore, but you're getting moving, you're getting recovery to move, um, you know, um, have that active recovery or warm up before a race, loosen up your legs. Um, my easy runs, I'll give them either a pace or an RP, depending on the athlete. Um, each of my athletes is different. So some of them have a longer, a broader pace than others. Um, some I'll say zone two, if they do have a heart rate monitor, others don't even have a heart rate monitor. So I give them just, you know, three to four RPE head out, just don't strain. But also, so they have the flexibility of going on group runs. Um, a lot of my athletes are in running groups and want that ability to run with their friends. And so I don't like to put too many parameters on that. I want them to go out and enjoy the sport and enjoy it with their people. Um, and knowing that if they're out on a group run, they're probably in a conversational pace. So more than likely. So I'll, I, I don't want to take, I want to take some stressors off the easy runs and make them just truly easy, relaxed, give them a day or two to not stare at their watch and worry about heart rate or pace or anything else. Um, and long runs are similar. I try to give them a like a slower pace if I give them a pace range on their long runs, because again, we're building that aerobic capacity and I really don't want them overstraining. I'm putting too much stress on unless it's a workout. Um, if it's a workout, I only give them paces. I don't tell them anything about heart rate. It's, you know, go out, like Scott said, you're going to have a three mile easy warm up, and then you're going to run two miles at this pace and then you're going to run a mile easy and it's all by feel um, or pace. So I really don't have them looking at their heart rate too much during those um, workouts. Yeah, I, I tend to program pretty similarly myself that um, a low heart rate run is most often used for recovery. Um, and that's a very 
has a very specific intent. This is a recovery run. You need to stay at this this effort or, or this zone or this heart rate um, to get the benefit of the rest of the week of the work that you've done or, or of that run. Um, Easy runs, um, the, the athlete who asked this was one of my athletes who found that they're, I prescribe your easy run by pace. I'm giving you typically a pretty wide pace range um, that I want you to stay within on that easy run. And his question was that um, his easy runs, he often finds that he's at or maybe even below his math uh, heart rate, his low heart rate zone, and asked, you know, is that correct? Is there a problem with that? Um, and, and I would answer to that, there's outside of prescribed intensity or a prescribed workout like a speed or a tempo session or a hill session um you, you can't do too much math it is okay if your easy run is at your low heart rate zone um so my my uh difference there between the two is is sort of the same as you it's just for the freedom um on that that heart rate run you are focused on your heart rate you are watching it making sure it stays in a very specific range whereas on an easy run you've got a little bit more flexibility you don't need to be married to your watch for the whole the whole session um we might throw some variety in there like some strides or some hill repeats into an easy run that's going to throw your heart rate up a little bit um but again, you're really kind of getting to run at a broader range. You've got a little bit more freedom. And, and Michelle, you made a great point about running with other people. That's You've got the flexibility there um, to, to enjoy a broader range, less specificity. Um, and on a long run, I typically would prescribe the same way. I, I just about never prescribe a heart rate range on a long run. Um, these are days if you don't have a specific workout, um, tempo miles or marathon paced miles that you're working into your long run, um, I think it's really important to have the freedom to go out and enjoy that run. Run it with people, run a, a different course than you might usually run during the week, um, but get some flexibility in there and focus on your effort. Uh, don't focus on your pace. I don't give pace numbers for long runs either. Don't focus on your heart rate, but go out there and put in a relaxed, comfortable effort um, rather than being married to the data because we're doing so much other data-driven work during the week and throughout your training cycle um, that those long runs should be free when you have the opportunity for them to be free. Um, so don't look at your heart rate according to me on your, on your long runs. Um, so, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. As I say, there's something that just came to mind with like long runs, especially in the summer. Another reason not to look at your heart rate, especially towards the end is cardiac drift. Your heart rate's going to steadily climb at the same pace because you're tired, you're dehydrated, it's getting hotter. And so like, I don't, I don't pay attention at the end because my same effort level is going to elicit a higher heart rate. Um, it's not a huge deal for those last few miles. If you're out of zone two, it's not doing anything horrible for you at all. It's, you know, but I just want to bring that up. Like cardiac drift just kind of pops into my head and <laughs> just thought it was worth yeah. bringing that up because it is a big deal, especially in the summer. A hundred percent. Well, and, and especially um, the first time that you're building to a new distance. And, and I don't mean a new distance like you've never run that distance before. I mean, within that block, you know, if, as your long runs are building, the first time that you're hitting that 12 miler, that 14, that 16, um, you're going to see more drift. Whereas you know, if you've done that distance a couple of weeks ago, you might not see as much drift. But that's a great point. Cardiac drift happens to everybody. It's going to happen in a race scenario also. Um, essentially what that means is that you're seeing at the what you might perceive as the same effort or at definitely at the same pace, you're seeing your heart rate increase as you get further into a run. And that's um, essentially just a result of fatigue, that it, it happens, it's normal, it's natural, and it's not something to avoid, um, especially for the purposes of race training, it's something to press through. Um, yeah, that's a great point. So, but that also leads into our next topic then is, um, I wanna talk a little bit about both high heart rate and when we should not be watching our heart rate. Um, so let's talk a little bit, let's, let's start with high heart rate is um, when is that a good, healthy thing to be pursuing? We're spending time in a defined low heart rate zone. Do we also spend time in a defined high heart rate zone? Definitely. Um, you know, your pace work, high pace workouts are gonna be high heart rate. Like you do intervals, it's gonna be 
at or near max heart rate, um, especially the shorter intervals. The shorter the intervals are, typically the higher your heart rate is going to be. Um, and they all play, like I said earlier, like, you know, you're going to have each zone in your training plan just to different varying degrees. So a lot of times um, early in a training cycle, you're working the extremes. You have your low and then you have your short bursts of high speed, um, you know, and that's going to build your aerobic fi your, your fitness overall and your running economy is going to improve at these faster speeds. So you start off smaller and faster and then you kind of back it off into wherever your goal race pace is, whether that's marathon pace, half marathon pace, 5K, whatever you're training for. Um, but especially like 5K, you're in that zone five, zone five all the way on these shorter runs. And the shorter the runs, the more time you're going to spend in those high heart rates. So, um, you know, like marathon athletes will have a, maybe a workout every few weeks that's really zone five, like max effort. Here's 30 second burst. Here's a, you know, 400 meter repeats or whatever we're doing. Um, and then like you might have some longer efforts that are zone three, zone four marathon pace. Um, but yeah, like I think every athlete, Again, with an asterisk, most athletes or 99% of athletes will be in zone five at some point in their heart rate um, in that zone. But we don't prescribe those by heart rate zone. We're not going to say, hey, run 30 seconds at zone five. And there's a few reasons for that. Like you're working on a pace. So like you have a goal time, you need to work in that goal pace. So whatever your heart rate is, your body will adapt to that pace. So you might start your marathon, say your marathon pace is 10 minutes per mile. You might start that in zone five coming in as a new runner. But through your training cycle, that might become zone four or zone three as you gain fitness because you're spending time in that high zone. But as as you get fitter, that pace in zone will change, like how they correlate. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> I'm trying to no, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, so your fitness, your, your pace, you're training for that pace and your body will get fitter in that same pace zone. So your heart rate does not matter when we're training that way. Um, you know, and the other thing is with these short bursts, your watch may not keep up. So when you're out there and you're gunning it for a minute, it's going to take 10, 20 seconds for your watch to catch up and realize what your heart rate is. So you can't train like that. You've got to just go hard, find the pace and stay in that. And you're going to get those adaptations that way um, versus heart rate training in that because it's going to, you're not going to be able to heart retrain for 30 seconds in a heart rate zone five. You won't even see it on your watch by the time you hit it. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, in the ultra world, uh, uh, again, athletes that I'm, that I'm coaching, not prescribing a high heart rate, right? We're, we're, let's talk about the workouts, the hard workouts. And so that could be, let's say on a Wednesday when you're doing some intervals, we're not focused on what that heart rate number looks like. We may be prescribing a pace. We may be prescribing something like that, but um, your body's going to know what to do, you know, and, and, and it should be, you should run um, that pace, that distance that you've got. Um, so for me, it would be in workouts uh, when it's not necessarily, don't don't worry about your heart rate. It's gonna climb, it's gonna spike. Um, going back to the element elements, right? If it's in the middle of the summer and you've got some hill repeats, it's probably gonna be pretty high. Um, and then also on race day, you know, I, 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 I go to, hey, if you're running a race, your body's smart, you've done the work, you've done the training, um, don't worry if it's a little bit high, right? And even even in an ultra marathon, your heart rate's going to be higher probably than what you're used to, let's say in a in a math run, right? And that's okay, that's normal. Um, so for me, it would be absolutely the workouts, those specific intervals, um, and it would also be I'll throw in there race day, you know, or or any like simulation of a race, right? Kind of where you're where you're where you're running harder, right, for a specific reason, so. Yeah, I personally yeah. don't even have my heart rate on my workouts. When I program my workout into my watch, um, I don't even see my heart rate personally. Like I prefer just to see the pace. It doesn't even matter what my heart rate is. You know, it's just it's just a piece of data we don't need during that kind of workout. I I totally agree. I think um if you can not even look at your heart rate when you're doing intensity, it's not a tool that we want to use in a and a high intensity session during the workout. It is a tool for analysis after the workout. So this is where you can lean on your coach um, if you're not sure um, or ask questions, but we are using that on our end to see when we have prescribed you a specific pace for a specific interval, um, your heart rate tells us how hard you were working to, to hit that pace, to reach that pace on that day. Um, but again, we're not 
prescribing you to reach a certain heart rate. We're prescribing you to reach for a pace or an effort if we're prescribing by effort. And your heart rate is feedback on how hard you were working, but it's not a tool that you wanna use in the moment while you're running the majority of the time. It's, it's analysis, not um, something that you should be guiding your run by um, with the exception of the low heart rate stuff. Um, and I think you guys both brought up a really good point about race day. And it, it can apply to speed sessions too, because I think people uh, get anxiety about speed sessions. And so your heart rate can be higher than you expect it to be. Um, and that can psych you out. It can be scary to see a high heart rate, especially if you don't think that you're working that hard um, and you see a number that's higher than you expect. On race day, that is almost a guarantee that you are gonna go out in an effort that you have trained, you have practiced, you are tapered, and so it feels reasonably comfortable to you. And your heart rate, if you were to look at it, is higher guaranteed than you are used to seeing it on an easy run or on a long run workout. Um, and that is stress induced. It's it's anxiety, it's excitement. That's not all bad. Um, it's, it's the stress of being at the start line, of being in a group um, and, it's also a sign that you are rested and your body is capable of doing some hard work. Um, so I really advise people, even if it is an all day, 100 mile event, 50 mile event, do not look at your heart rate on race day. If you typically run with a chest strap or an arm strap, leave it at home. Don't even wear it. Um, if you see heart rate on your main screen on your watch, either agree with yourself that you're not going to look at it or you're not going to care about it. Um, or switch to a different screen so that you don't even see it because your heart rate will be higher on race day than you're used to seeing it in training. Um, one of the examples I really love to give of that, um, and I think it's cool, elite athletes are starting to share more of their personal data after a big race or a big event. And I think that's really cool because it makes it relatable for your average person. Um, so there's a couple of different examples recently within the past year or so, maybe a little bit more. Um, Molly Seidel, Olympic bronze medalist marathoner. She released her uh, Coros data from the New York City Marathon. Um, and she ran, I wanna say like 226 or so. I think she was the top American that year. Um, her average heart rate for that race was 177 for two and a half hours of racing. Um, that's, you know, some people might, if you do the math on your max heart rate, that's right about there for some people. And some people might be really scared to hit that number at all. Um, whereas you see her holding this heart rate, sustaining this heart rate for two and a half hours of racing. Um, an even better example, and I think this is really kind of concretes the point of your heart rate's gonna be higher in racing and that's okay. Your body can do it. Um, Camille Heron is the world record hundred miler. Um, when she set her hundred mile world record, this was, I think it was just under 12 hours. Maybe it was just over. It was right around that 12 hour barrier. Um, so 12 continuous hours of running. There's no stopping in there. There's no sleeping. There's no rest. It is continuous 12 hours of running. Her average heart rate for that event was 182. 182 for 12 continuous hours of running. Um, so when you see those high heart rates, it's so your body can do that. You can te train your body to do that. Um, and if your body can't sustain that high heart rate, it's gonna let you know. Um, so that's the next point I wanna get to. And part of the reason I bring out those examples to show it is okay, it is safe to see high heart rates on your watch. Um, for sustained periods of time is, I think a lot of people have questions about that is how high is too high is one of the most frequent questions I get is my heart gonna explode? What, what happens when I push my heart rate to X number, uh, Y number? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how, how do we know when your body has reached its, its max and what happens when you get there? Is is it dangerous to reach for those high numbers? Well, I think it, it, to your point, I mean, your body's smart. It's it's gonna know. I think that um, 
probably an example I can give is, is you're, you're going to slow down and shut down, right? Before anything from a heart perspective is going to happen. So a um, couple of data points that I, that I look at, right? Again, going back to the elements, you know, whether it's weather, whatever, is, you know, if somebody, if one of my athletes is, their pace is just much slower, right? On a normal everyday run, you know, that could be a sign that, that, that they're, that they're worn down, that they're a little bit tired. So um, I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but I think it's a data point to look at in terms of what does your body do, right? When it's stressed, when it's taxed, um, going to your point, your heart's not going to explode, right? Your body's going to show you in other ways that it needs maybe some more rest. It needs to, to slow down a little bit. Um, so that's one thing that, that I look at is, is what is their over the course of a week, let's say, what is their pace looking like? Is, is there any specific days that really looked like it was a little bit more of a struggle? Um, and I think that that may be maybe one of the easiest ways to kind of pinpoint it is when your body just tells you we're, we're tired, we're slowing down, um, as opposed to looking at the heart rate and saying, oh my gosh, it was really high this day. So therefore I think something's going on. So um, that would be the way that I, that I look at it on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, your heart, your heart rate's going to get really high and it's going to, it feels bad. So like at a certain point, your body's going to say, okay, your muscles are going to burn, your lungs aren't going to be able to keep up and you're going to slow down before, you know, your, before your heart hurts. I don't even know if your heart can. I don't know if that's the thing that actually happens or I've never heard of it happening. Um, but you're, you know, you're going to stop. Your body will stop you from doing any more activity when it gets to that critical threshold. Um, you know, yeah, it, Michelle, one thing <laughs> like it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I just thought about it. You, you, you mentioned, you know, your how you feel, right? When your heart gets get, heart rate gets really high. One thing that I notice um, with uh, athletes who are who are training for longer events, right? Maybe it's a marathon, ultra, whatever, is in the beginning of their training, right? A hard session, an interval, or where they're getting their heart rate high, they're the huffing and puffing, the grasping for air, right? But as you train and grow you know, throughout the course of a training cycle, you're going to find at the end, most likely, that you're not huffing as, and puffing as much. It's not that, but your heart rate is still high. So you're, mm -hmm. you're maintaining that high heart rate, but your body has adjusted and now it's able to handle that stress a little bit more. And so that is one data point I just thought of in terms of looking at it um, from, let's say, the beginning of a training cycle to the end. Kind of how efficient is your body now in handling that high heart rate? Yeah, that's a great point. And and I think just to emphasize, um, I, w as we were talking earlier about data points, your the maximum heart rate that you can calculate with a math formula is probably not accurate to the individual. Um, again, huge variations here based on your fitness, based on your consistency. Um, and And again, to emphasize, most of us probably don't know what our true maximum heart rate is. Um, so to, to make a preconceived judgment based on a, a number that we've come up with it, it is probably not accurate. Um, however, you can also train to reach your max heart rate. You can run at your maximum heart rate. Not for very long because it's really freaking hard, <laughs> but you can get there and you can touch that number and, and it's okay. Um, but to both of your points, what will happen when your body has had enough and can't handle that anymore um, is you are going to have it's going to slow down. Your your muscles are going to burn. You're going to get um, build up and it's going to shut things down. That doesn't mean shut down as in uh, like you're going to hit the ground, your heart's going to explode. You're literally going to slow because your your muscles in your legs, in your core, in your lungs, you can't continue to pump at the same effort. So you're going to reach that max heart rate. You can hold it for a short period of time as your body will allow. And then your body is going to slow and, and decrease because it can't hold you there. Um, so that's what happens when when your heart has had enough. It doesn't explode. You don't collapse. You slow down. It, it, your body is smart in, in that. Um, but you can reach those numbers. And the, the more fit that you are, you are able to drive that number higher. Um, that's a good point too, that uh, 
the being capable of driving your heart rate high is something to strive for is is a sign of fitness and you can push those numbers both higher and sustain them for longer the more fit that you are um to our point of variety of needing both and all ends of the spectrum um as part of your training um so i think that leads into there was another question we got when we uh put out for question and answer within the run squad group um someone had asked what happens if you train at a high heart rate too often um are you doing damage um i don't know if either of you wants to i can certainly elaborate upon that but i'll throw it to, to you guys first what happens when you train too often at a high heart rate or what could happen so you're just not getting full benefit of your training. It's really, it. it's not that you're, I mean, you're doing damage in the sense that you're not recovering. So I don't think that the actual training for that long at that heart rate is causing mass amounts of damage, but your gains come from recovery. They don't come from the workouts. So you're just shortchanging every aspect of your training when you do that. So if you continually do too many hard workouts and aren't properly recovered between them, your body's not building muscle. It's not repairing the damage and you know, add, you know, adding to your muscles, making you stronger. So you're just gonna, eventually it's gonna break you down because you're not recovered. Your body's gonna continually get muscle tear after muscle tear after muscle tear. And you're gonna either end up injured or completely burned out or fatigued um, and ill rested. And you're probably gonna see your, your resting heart rate and your normal training heart rates are going to increase in response to that because again, you're not recovering. So just, you know, I think remembering that your gains come when you're not running versus when you're running like the mental gains come from your training but the physical gains come from your recovery Scott, you looked like you had something to add to there i don't want to start talking on top of you and not give you a chance no, no i i i my, my thought on that is exactly what <laughs> michelle uh, just mentioned um but i also think if if you're constantly training at a high heart rate knowing that every athlete's a little bit different maybe it's time to analyze why is that, right? Is it, are you not fully, to Michelle's point, not fully recovered? Um, or maybe you're just, you know, used to running in that one, that one pace. A lot of athletes tell me they love being at that certain pace all the time. It feels good. And yeah, it does. But if your heart rate is constantly high, it's probably your body telling you something. Um, and so talking to your coach about is it, is it time to slow down? Is it time to you know, maybe throw in a little bit more recovery. What is that? I think that's probably my number one thought is if somebody's heart rate is constantly high or at a higher level more often than not, um, it's time to take a look at, are you running too hard? Are you, what's causing that, right? So. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's important to distinguish that running at a high heart rate too often is variable what is too often uh, again it depends depends on the athlete depends on what you're training for um but to kind of elaborate on michelle's point the the way that we get stronger faster better is we do a hard session whether that's in the gym or on the road or on the track um when you do a hard session or, or in the mountains i want to make sure i hit the ultra true ultra crew too or a really long effort um you are doing damage to your muscles, to your actual muscle fibers. Um, that's important. That's that's it's healthy so long as you're getting the flip side of that with recovery. So it's stress plus rest equals growth. So you are stressing the muscles. You are literally doing physical damage to your muscle fibers, and then you have to give them a chance to heal in order to see those muscles adapt in order to make them stronger, faster to improve. Um, so if you are constantly doing damage, 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 and you're not getting that recovery time, you're only running at a high heart rate too often, um, you are breaking your body down. You are breaking down your, your skeletal muscle. You are going to get injured or you are going to burn out. Um, overtraining is what we call that. Overtraining is actually under recovering. It's not actually over training um it's under recovery or or can be under fueling also um so yeah that's if you are running at a high heart rate too often you are going to damage your muscle tissue you are going to damage your performance um, you have to give your body those muscle fibers time to heal from the damage of a high intensity session uh, in order to improve and to see 
gains short term and long term, um, even just run to run, but also certainly in the big picture as well. Um, that too often I'd be like, I'm sorry, like if, go ahead. if too often, like it depends on the athlete, like, you know, everything else we said is dependent on the athlete, like too often for an ultra marathoner who's running 60, 80 miles a week looks very different than someone who's training for a 5k and probably can do three quality sessions, but they're only training 20 miles a week. So there's a very different, so I don't want anyone to like listen to this and think, oh my gosh, I had three sessions this week. That's too much. Cause it may not be depending on your fitness and your goals. Like 5k athletes are going to spend a lot more time in that high intensity zone because you can recover faster. Whereas one quality effort for a marathon runner might be well more than enough. Um, and they might need every other week quality session. So it just, it's dependent. So there's not like a hard and fast rule of what's too much. It, it's all everything. I feel like everything we say, it depends. Um, and that's one of those things. It just depends. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I think, um, you know, here as we're talking about low heart rate and recovery too, um, it, looking at how many days a week you are running. So it, to your point, if you're running three days a week, you might not have a specific low heart rate run in your week because you're already resting four days or maybe if you're not even um, resting in, in the true sense, but you have just your activities of daily living. Those are often in a low heart rate zone too. What, going for a walk, playing with your kids, cleaning the house. Um, those are all low heart rate activities also. Um, so when you look at your training plan, like you said, you might have three runs a week and they're all at a higher intensity because your off days are essentially serving as your recovery time. You don't need to train recovery if you're taking rest or, or recovering in different ways. Um, okay, so I think an interesting, now that we are podcasting, um, I think maybe an interesting way to wrap up this conversation is how we as individuals are using heart rate training um, or heart rate feedback in our own training. We The three of us are in three completely different phases, training for different events. Um, so I guess I thought maybe it would be interesting to talk about ourselves and use ourselves as just a, a quick, short example. We don't need to talk in depth about our own training, at least on this episode. Um, but let's let's talk about that. So um, Scott, you are training primarily for ultra running this season. Your, your two big goal, you do have a speed goal on your calendar, um, a, sh a shorter event, but your two big goals are both all day events. Um, you've got a, a 45 mile trail run and a 50 mile race. Um, so how are, what does your training look like in terms of how you're using heart rate and feedback um, when you're training for those kinds of long day, long distance events? Yeah, specifically, I look at it um, usually two to three days out of each week is going to be dedicated towards heart rate specific training. You know, I use the math method. Um, typically, it's going to be uh, the day after a really intense workout, even training for ultras and all day events. There's some high intensity specific intervals that, you know, I'm incorporating into my routine the next day since that workout was a really high stressor on my body, I'm incorporating low heart rate, math training, um, because I use it as active recovery in a sense, right? I'm still logging the miles, but I'm, but I'm running slow and I'm ensuring that I'm allowing my body to fully recover um, while I'm still getting some miles in. So that would be one area that I do it. Um, and then in the other area is, is, and not necessarily in the long run, looking at a specific heart rate number right but in the long run that i have each week i'm really focused on what my body's telling me right so uh, today for example i just had my long run this morning and really hot really humid and although i didn't look at the number i didn't look at the heart rate number i was constantly monitoring okay what do i need do i need more fluids do i need more fuel um you know, should I slow down on this hill? Should I, you know, so I constantly am, am really kind of assessing in the long run, um, you know, what my body is saying. Um, but most specifically, I would say two to three days out of the week. Um, and primarily it's going to be ap after hard efforts um, or two really in a, in a long run where maybe I need a little bit more focus on what my body's telling me. Yeah. So Michelle is in a completely different place um, than Scott is. If you don't mind me saying, Michelle is injured um, and has been resting for a couple weeks. Um, so let's talk about uh, 
how you were using heart rate, both um, in the training that you were doing at the time the injury came on and also how we're planning to use it when you return to running because so we're just about there we're a couple of days away from the return to running um and and i think it would be interesting to talk about how it's going to change or or i can elaborate on it if you want yeah. me to but let's talk about that no so i i kind of update my uh, math heart rate using math calculator um every year or every couple training cycles i'll kind of go through because it's just based on your age and your fitness level so i i recalculated actually the start of this season i recalculated my math heart rate and gained um a nice five more points which i was super psyched about um and then quickly re lost those again so i gained those five points because i had gone two years without injury no major illnesses like i had got, I had solid training so I, I earned some more points on my math um and now that i'm injured those were quickly taken away and then some so my math heart rate is about to go way down um which means i'm going to be coming back at a much slower pace um but that makes sense i'm also been off for several weeks so my pace is going to be slower when i return anyway um so that's where it's heading it's going to be a lot slower um and it's going to take some discipline I use um, heart rate training for my math runs and my easy runs. So I don't see pace at all. I set my watch so I don't see my pace on my math runs. I don't know what it is till I finish. Um, and the same with my easy runs. I, I do hear it each mile on my easy runs, but I don't see it while I'm running. Um, but that's because I'll get a pace prescription for my easy runs and my heart rate always aligns with the pace zone. But if I see that you know 45 second range, I'm a competitive person. So I'm gonna try to err on the faster side of that run versus where I might need to be on the slower side. Um, so I purposely set my heart rate so that I have an alert when I get too high. It's the top of zone three on my easier runs so that I don't go into zone four, zone five. I'm not pushing too hard, but I'm still end up being in that zone two, zone three heart rate, which does align with the pace I'm prescribed. So it kind of keeps me in check mentally where I don't try to speed up or if I'm having a day where I'm not as recovered, I'm seeing even outside of that range slower. I mean, it just needs to be where I am. So I don't see the pace and it doesn't mess with me mentally to say, push a little harder because I, I'm i the type that will push too hard. Um, and I do set a high heart rate alert, only a high one on my long runs. And that's for the same reason, because I will push too hard. Uh, and that one's a little bit higher. I give myself a little more grace on my long runs. I think it's like 170 because of hills. And I know I'm gonna be high up on the hills. But it's just to keep me in check. So that's how I use heart rate is just to make sure I'm not overtraining and pushing too hard. Um, and then with my pace workouts, the exact opposite. I don't see my heart rate at all. All I see is my distance and pace and my lap pace so that I'm in that exact pace range. I'm not worrying about what my heart rate looks like on that day. I'm worrying if I'm overtraining. So it's I use the both interchangeably. I use pace and heart rate. Um, and then on some long runs or group runs, I have nothing set. I don't see anything but distance just so I can enjoy and disconnect from all the data um, and just spend time with friends and, you know, just enjoy running without, because I feel like you need that too. You need those days where you just don't look at anything. And that's important to, um, you know, because like you said earlier, like too many data points, you get, it's a lot of data overload that we can give ourselves these days. So it's nice to disconnect from that and just get in tune with your body and feel what it feels like to just run. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and, and to clarify, coming back from an injury. So, you know, we talked about um, in low heart rate training using that um, math method, math maximum aerobic function to calculate the baseline of where your heart rate heart rate might be and mentioned that that's a starting point. So the more consistent that you are and the healthier and fitter you become, the more we can uh, increase that heart rate a little bit. Um, the If you are someone who is injured or has repeated injury or repeated illness is another good sign, we're gonna take that number down a little bit. So it's not just a firm set number. Um, so to clarify, coming back from injury we are gonna decrease, your, your low heart rate zone is gonna be a little bit lower and that's primarily out of an abundance of caution. A, an injury is your body telling us something. There was a problem um, that we need to listen and respond to and because you have been off for a period of time, it's been a, a several weeks at this point, um, we want to ease back in. Now that's not to say that you're gonna stay at that low heart rate zone for a uh, long period of time and it's gonna take years to earn back the increase, um, we, we can even increase it pretty quickly because you have such a hardy base prior to the injury um, of uh, training. But 
we start at a decreased low heart rate zone to, to really listen to your body in the return to running phase. Um, yeah, so for myself, um, I am training primarily for a marathon. Um, I'm also throwing an ultra goal in there after the marathon, but my training is really focused on the marathon. Um, and I am a high mileage runner. I, I really thrive at somewhere in like the 80 to 90 miles a week zone. Um, and so I am doing uh, low heart rate runs on everything that's not a workout. Um, so I have two workouts a week that are higher intensity sessions. And again, I'm, I'm not looking at my heart rate on those either. I'm really trying to train my legs and my body for an effort and a pace rather than a heart rate. Um, that's two sessions out of the week. So I am running four to five other sessions during the week. And those are all at a low heart rate, um, in a low heart rate zone by number at, at my math heart rate or under, um, and that's how I'm able to sustain a, a high mileage training si style is by doing so much of that low heart rate running. I've really built my aerobic base um, to be quite large and kept my body reasonably healthy by making sure that I'm listening to it and staying in that that low range. I don't think I can be, and, and I've had periods um, where I haven't been able to sustain high mileage in the same way um, when I haven't followed my heart rate in that way. And I've done um, more of the gray zone training. Um, I do include some of that during the week um, throughout the year, but not on a regular basis. Um, I, I find that my body really needs that recovery in response to the intensity. So I just, I think it's interesting that um, we are all using it in a different way for ourselves um, or, or the way that we're training this season in the moment. Um, and we're using it in different ways for every single athlete that we coach. It's not, there is not a, a heart rate training method. It mm -hmm. really depends on the athlete, on the season, on the experience, on the thing there, the event that they're training for. Um, there is no one way, but hopefully this was really helpful to everybody listening to get a, a basic understanding of how we use heart rate in training um, and gives you sort of a sense of how you can apply it um, for yourself or an understanding of how it's applying to your training that you're currently in um, and, and how we're using it for uh, prescription and for analysis on your training and on your workouts. Um, do you guys have anything else to add? No, I think it was a, a great discussion and um, lots of good information. Yeah, I have nothing else to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it for our uh, heart rate training episode, at least so far. Um, like I said, we really encourage um, anyone who has questions, either you can post it on social media when we uh, share the podcast or directly message us if it's something, I know a lot of people don't like to ask questions publicly, maybe they feel like it's a bad question or they should know the answer or something like that. But that's why we're doing this podcast is because so many people have the questions. And even when you have a coach, maybe you are embarrassed to ask your coach about why, um, or, or you've just never thought to ask why I'm doing this type of training or, or doing things the way I'm doing. So um, our goal with this podcast is to share information. And if, if there are questions that we can answer, we want to do that. That's what we're here for. So um, you can find our podcast on Spotify and also on YouTube. Um, on Spotify, we are The More Miles Podcast. On YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, you can find us at More Miles Run Coaching. And you can either ask us a question there in the comments or uh, directly in a message. You can also find More Miles Run Coaching, our website, is more miles to go.com and you can reach each of us individually um, through our website you can read a little bit more about us as a team as well as us as individuals um, athletes and coaches so okay thanks for joining me guys i had a good time chatting through this with you both thank you thank you